Peter mentioned, we read about these challenges on the, on the field, or in the field, rather, on the ground, and you just feel deflated. Oh my gosh, how are we going to get this to work? And the mechanism for that is the development of systems. And in all fairness, an operations manual is not a system. It's a step. It's a step in the right direction. It's the identification and articulation of those processes and procedures that work within that system that are going to make this achievable. And kind of putting that whole systems piece along with documentation and along with sort of the assessment that I did into my sort of professional toolkit I think is going to be a really important element moving forward as a practitioner. Because as I said, when you're designing, designing these interventions and you're not considering the other half of how it's going to work, um, you can end up with some real um, implementation some of the limitations of this um, are essentially if your organization doesn't have a commitment to it, as I mentioned, the strategic approach that Pathfinder took to system strengthening, it's not going to happen because it requires both staff time, which is already limited, and budget. So if your board or if your senior management team aren't willing to kind of take a, take a beat and take a breath and kind of look at systems, it won't happen. Um, I kind of touched on a lot of these strengths, but essentially what we're talking about here is, is improved efficiency and efficiency with funding. And I think that that's something that you can kind of take away and become known for in this space. Well, Pathfinder or whatever organization it may be, they have the same amount of funding and they reach this many people. They have the same amount of funding and they were able to provide this many services instead of this organization in the same type of setting. Um, and that's a competitive advantage, and it's a competitive advantage as an individual who's working in this in this house space. Um, improving quality of service, I'm going to talk about that in a minute, so I'm going to hold off there. Um, and then fewer costly mistakes. Anyone who's ever been involved in importing goods knows that it's a nightmare, and that can be exceptionally costly on your budget because it's not going to be a line item to cover the cost of keeping a pallet of medicines on the dock because you don't have the proper documentation filled out. And that could be thousands and thousands of dollars that end up coming out of unrestricted funding, staff time, some of these other things that are really essential and hard-earned dollars. So what happened? Six weeks later, and granted, I did get to work on a couple of very health-specific initiatives, but those are kind of still ongoing. Um, what, 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 what did I create? And basically, this is it. It's a 75, which is the first time I've actually seen it printed out because it's mm -hmm. so long. It's, um, it's a 73 page manual. It's not uh, sexy. It's not a mobile app. It's not, <laughs> um, it's not mapping clinics and knowing. It isn't. But what it is, is a tool. It's a resource for all those program staff that were in the dark and feeling sort of powerless and how to do their jobs. And that's huge. And in addition to writing this, this manual, this big beast, um, I also was tasked with coming up with the corrective action plan, which is this little guy right here. <laughs> Basically, what are you gonna do about it? What are we gonna do about these systems that aren't working? What do I recommend that you do is, in terms of action steps moving forward? And, Here's the bumper sticker part of my presentation. Um, as I mentioned, this wasn't a mobile app. I wasn't down in the dirt working with the community health workers. I was, for the most part, sitting in an office writing. And that was kind of a hard pill to swallow at the beginning because, as I said, I came to Corbell to go live in a hut and pee the tree and, you know, ride around in a white vehicle.
think the number is 25,850 hours that's saved in one year. That's huge. Staff time is a huge, huge cost driver, especially in these types of interventions. And time savings doesn't equate with, with cost savings, but that means that they're spending that time doing their jobs, focusing on interventions, focusing on improving our community home-based care interventions, focusing on a training for skilled birth attendants. And, um, let's just think this through. So, one of our program staffers spends that 15 minutes or that hour on a training for skilled birth attendants. And because of that extra time, they're able to spend a little bit more time focusing on identifying clearly the signs and symptoms of postpartum hemorrhage, PPH, which is a huge problem all throughout Sub-Saharan Africa. And because of that extra time, the skilled birth attendant that goes to that training is that much more empowered, that much more knowledgeable about those signs and symptoms. And because of that, when their client actually starts experiencing PPH, they know that they have to get to them to a health facility. Here's the big assumption, that there is a facility to go to and that they actually have the blood and services that that woman needs. But as far as I'm concerned, Pathfinder is not a service delivery organization. We've done everything we can at that point to get that woman to the facility. And because of that, maybe her life got saved. And if you multiply that 15 minutes by all of those program officers, by all Pathfinder's offices throughout the globe, because there is an expectation that this will be scaled up to every office, that's huge. And that's a lot of lives saved. And I wasn't there. I didn't do that training. I didn't get that woman to the health facility. I wrote a 75-page document that helps people do their jobs better. And ultimately, that's pretty awesome. <laughs>
was also informed by activities in Tanzania, and then also kind of bringing in those other pieces from other offices and saying, you could adapt this for yourself. Do you need to work more with consultants? Here, here's the piece that you could fold into this. Um, so I hope that yep. successfully answers your question. Yes. I'd like to double down on, on Micah's question, though. And, and, Please do. Um, <laughs> there's the, obviously, there's the linguistic divide between Swahili and English, sure. kind of vernacular and sort of the global techni technorati or whatever, but there's also the linguistic divide between systems people and clinical people. Sure. And, in, and I don't just mean, say, medical professionals. Anyone who's on the ground, yeah. practitioners, is, was there a, a sort of, uh, were you sort of conceptually having to use or using some kind of Sort of translation method that would allow you to sort of make take systems thinking and make it relevant to the lives of practitioners who may be like, I hate your toolkit, or I see, or, 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 or is it that they, they see the value of systems? Um, great question. I think that the key there for me is in this particular case, and granted, this has not been scaled up to all of our offices yet. This is something that we face across the board, even with systems at headquarters. People just don't want to invest the time to use a new resource, to use a new tool. Um, so the key there is just showing them how it's going to benefit them. And the way that I did that was through training. So I would talk to someone and I would say, hey, how do you do this? And they would either look at me dumbfounded, or they would say, well, sometimes I do this, and then sometimes they tell me I have to do this. Instead, opening up the resource, opening up the tool, and saying, hey, this is how you do it. Click on this. Literally, mind blown. Oh my gosh, this is, I can't believe this. This is so easy. Why didn't I know this before? And making that sort of cost savings argument. You're spending two hours doing this. In the, in the case of Arusha, or our field office up near Kil Kilimanjaro, they're spending four days waiting for something. Four days. So, so saying to them, hey, these are the resources. This is the person that you need to go to to ask specific questions about this. Here's the org chart. Here's the procedure for procurement. Here are the expectations for vouchers. Right there. Now go do your job. And they were like, oh, yes, thank you. This is awesome. So I don't think it's a matter of kind of translating that kind of divide. You've got to show it. And that's, that's how we were successful in this sort of piece. Can I answer your question? Absolutely. Great. And you did get to Arusha. I did. Beautiful. <laughs> kind of like the Hampshire, so I love it. <laughs> Any other questions, or maybe we'll move on, just in the interest of time. So next up, we have Amy Dempsey, who was with the USAID mission in Ethiopia.
to kind of develop something and find something that um, would be more substantive, like one chunky project that I can work on throughout the summer. I was happy to do these things, and I knew it was important to be flexible and kind of do whatever they needed me to do, but I wanted to do something that wasn't so much focused on my past experience, something that was more um, tailored to my future experience or my future career goals. So I um, talked, I held a lot of meetings with all of my supervisors, or I had two supervisors. I held a lot of meetings with them for several weeks, and nothing really came of them. Um, I told them what I was interested in, and they had kind of said that they would just, they'd poke around, do some research, and try to figure out what I could work on, and they'd get back to me, and then they would never get back to me. So um, I went around to the different teams in the health office to ask what was going on that I could work on. They didn't really know of anything that an intern could contribute to either. Um, so that went on for about a month. And then I had another meeting with one of my, with my secondary supervisor, and she told me that in January of this year, a gender consulting team had gone from Washington, D.C. to the Ethiopia mission, and their overall goal was just, just to do an assessment of the Happen Office and to see how the Happen Office was integrating its integrating gender strategies into its processes and uh, the programs that it was currently funding, and also how it could do so better in the future. So they had they provided long-term and short-term recommendations, and this was in January, so six months later, seven months later when I was there, no one had followed through on any of the recommendations. So some of the immediate recommendations were to create a gender integration mission order, and then also to provide additional tr gender training to each technical team. And then some of the long-term recommendations were the male engagement programs, entertainment and media programs, and then a more robust approach to combating female genital mutilation. My internship wasn't long enough for me to um, see through to any of the long-term recommendations, so I became responsible for the gender integration mission order, and I'll go over all the things that um, that encompass. But first, just a couple women's health facts in Ethiopia. So maternal mortality stands at 673 per 100,000 births. Infant child mortality is at 67 per 1,000. And 80% of women between the ages of 15 and 49 have undergone some type of female genital mutilation. Also, the Global Gender Gap Index puts Ethiopia at 122 out of 130. The Human Development Index puts it at 157 out of 169 countries. And 30% of girls between the ages of 15 and 19 years old are already married. And girls who are, are women, even though they're actually, some of them are girls, many of them are girls, um, under the age of 24, only about 9% of them have ever been part of a formal education, uh, formal education program. So after talking with my supervisor um, more about what all she wanted the mission order to encompass, um, she recognized the lack of gender integration strategies throughout the entire mission, not just the health office. So it now transitioned from a health or a, yeah, a health gender-related mission order to one that encompassed every technical sector um, that USAID works in. So that was like agriculture, education, human rights, democracy and governance, um, emergency food distribution, and emergency foreign disaster assistance. So the overall scope of a mission order and what it actually is, is that it establishes gender-related policies in each sector. Um, technical teams essentially use it as a document of authority, um, kind of as a reference that they can do cross-checking with gender-related issues in programming proposals. Um, it's basically just a set of guidelines. It also defines roles and responsibilities for each technical office and, and also the implementing partners in the design, implementation, <coughs> monitoring, and evaluation. Um, later on, I'll show you some of the recommendations that I included in it. Um, but another major component of it was that it established a gender and youth committee, which was a mechanism within the USA Ethiopia mission that was just meant to hold the all the technical teams and the technical offices accountable and to see to ensure that they were actually using the mission order um, when they're considering which programs to fund. So prior to doing anything, I had a ton of research to do. Um, this is just a handful of documents that I had to read through. Um, it took a lot of time and a lot of coffee. Um, I also had, I met with several different representatives in every technical office, um, because a lot of the a lot of the sectors that USA works in, I'm really unfamiliar with. I, um, so I wanted to meet with them just to make sure that I really understood how women and girls 
girls are impacted differently than men and boys in in the uh, economic growth and transformation office or in the alternative livelihoods and transitions office. So I wanted to make sure that I was asking the right questions and it also helped me identify <coughs> suggestions, potential strategies that USA could look for in future um, in future programs. So um, in addition to reading a ton of documents and meeting with people, I also traveled to the northern region in Ethiopia, in Tigray, and also the southern region. Um, I went to observe an initiative with Save the Children, which is their food by prescription program. They provide dietary supplements to mothers living with HIV AIDS and also to their children. Um, anyone under age five and tuberculosis patients. Um, we met with regional health bureaus to kind of identify which gaps exist in um, gender integration in their in their um, health systems because in Ethiopia it's a very decentralized system. So um, it was important to meet with the regional health bureaus because they might have something that's completely contextually specific in the southern region than to the northern region. Um, I also met with uh, people from Population Council to observe um, another program that was being implemented. It was one program, but it was being implemented in a rural village and also in an urban center. And it was really interesting to see how um, how my perceptions prior to arriving were completely different than the reality on the ground. Um, I went there thinking that women in rural villages would be more vulnerable to certain things than the women and the girls in the urban centers because they're geographically closer to so many resources, but it ended up being completely opposite. So, um, some of the recommendations that I included in the, um, in the health section of the mission order, which these are just illustrative, they're not binding or anything like that. Um, promoting the use of training manuals and materials in several languages to just ensure more inclusivity of all groups. There are more than 90 languages spoken in Ethiopia, and most of the um, most of the training manuals are written in maybe three or four languages. Also, menstruation education for women and girls, um, providing more resources to health extension workers like cell phones and training manuals. Also, increasing HIV AIDS education and prevention um, for women and girls working in informal sectors. In the education component, um, the development of sex segregated sanitation facilities in schools, working to eradicate physical and sexual abuse in schools, promoting science and math programs for girls, um, leadership initiatives for girls, and vocational and money saving education programs for girls as well. In the ALT section, um, just ensure that women and men have equal access to and control over the food aid that they receive. See to it that the heads of household distribute the food evenly between their sons and daughters, because that was a, that was a big um, concern. Also, um, the PSNP program, the Productive Safety Net program, is a program that distributes food aid, but there's a public works component in it. And basically, to receive any food aid, you have to do some type of like agriculture work. Um, so there are currently some safeguards for pregnant women and women who are breastfeeding so that they don't have to be part of that work. Um, so to continue that, I think it's something that's really important. Also incorporating um, income generation and safety measures for women in refugee camps and considering the nutritional needs of pregnant women in refugee camps and at distribution sites because they obviously need more food and more calories than someone who is not pregnant. Um, okay, so the mission order also created this in terms of reference and the scope of work for a gender and youth committee that is specific to the USA Ethiopia mission. Um, it consists of one representative from each technical office um, and also a backup representative from each technical office in case the other, the first person cannot be there. They hold bi-monthly meetings to review project designs for gender and youth related components. Um, there's one committee leader who has decision making authority and that role can change periodically however often they see fit. Um, they also ensure that each program that's funded allocates enough funding for gender and youth related components of a, of a program. They advise on gender and youth related initiatives or issues and uh, they provide training. And they can they can uh, bring training in for whatever from whatever mechanism they see fit. So consultants, expert specialists from in the country or out of the country, USA or not. So I think that's
I'm just doing a, get the applause first. Um, can you just clarify what you meant by menstruation education? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so a lot of um, women and girls, especially, they don't have any, they don't have a sex education like we have here. So they do, a lot of them just have no idea what's going, what that means, what's going on in their body. So any type of information can benefit them. Also, um, something I didn't put on in the PowerPoint, but um, the knee, I know Renee, you did some, you and Ellen did some stuff with this over the summer, but um, having, allowing them to have access to sanitary pads, because a lot of what happens when girls are on their periods, they don't go to school because they have to share a huge bathroom with male students and they don't have sanitary pets, so what do you use? They don't have anything. So something in addition to um, just education, that would be something that's really beneficial. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned that you monitored uh, distribution of food between sons and daughters. How did you monitor that? Well, so I did not personally monitor it, but um, that's something that the alternative, uh, alternative livelihood distribution offices do. And it's not, it's something that there, there's a huge gap. They, they don't know. Once you give food to a mother or a father, they take it and they distribute it as they want. But they have done surveys um, just in schools among school-aged children to see like who was more weak and secure. And it was overwhelming to that, that young girls were not receiving the same amount of food. So. Yeah. Um, so did you manage to sneak the men in at all? Or? Is that strictly a future sort of focus? Uh, for the like the recommendations? As far as here? you said, long men, getting men involved in gender is a long-term goal. Yeah. Were you able to sort of add anything about a focus on men in the short term? So um, in the gender, in the actual document, um, there is a, a, a section in there about having working with fathers and community leaders and religious leaders on getting them involved, and school-age boys as well. Um, yeah, because yeah, that is a huge component. Can't do it without it. My other question is: Did uh, Dan Verschneider uh, give you advice on uh, from his presentation for this award? No, I don't know that he even knew that I was applying for it. Because <laughs> he was there for like maybe a week and then he left, and I had it. Was our first time that one of our contestants has run into a past contestant. <laughs> which is very, very exciting. And, and his, his focus largely on a, a beer road.
So it's one of my particular interests. And even though we have policy frame frameworks to make young people's lives better and to avoid certain social risks, um, still we have a, a high uh, rate of adolescent pregnancies and unwanted pregnancies. Um, girls that stop going to school because they have their menstrual period. And so this is one Um, so to illustrate that, um, so a girl from one of the focus groups said, the other thing is that you have hairs down there, and then you get your period. And you're not only a girl, but you have your period. So you're prohibited from going out. Some families think that only be that only because you're a woman. And you, don't ha you can't be out talking to someone. You have to be careful now. You are limited from certain opportunities. So it's not only the stigma of, you know, bleeding eight days or five days a month, uh, but it's also this overprotection of girls because there's like a social, you know, perception that, yeah, they might become pregnant, yes, they might have sex, um, so they stop, you know, they don't go out from their houses anymore, um, and this can be risky in many ways because they'll run off anyways with a boyfriend. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so what is cycle means? Uh, it, it's a natural family planning method that was developed by the Institute for Reproductive Health and it's a necklace made of um, plastic beads and it's a way of monitoring your fer fertility cycle so you can understand which days are your fertile uh, days, your fertile window, when is it safer to have sex this is usually used by uh, adult women or, or adult um, couples. Uh, as a woman, you have, as an adult woman, you have a more uh, constant cycle. So with adolescents, the, the idea is to explore how this can start the conversation on how to get you know your body, your changing body. Imagine, girls, go back a few years. <laughs> Guys, just imagine. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> what it, it would have been like to just see blood one day without knowing what to do, what it is, when it's going to happen again. So this could start the conversation. And Cycle Beats is a method that is being used in 53 countries right now. Uh, so IRH, the Institute for Reproductive Health, wants to explore how to use it with adolescents in different countries. One of them? So what was my part in, in, in this whole thing? Um, so four focus groups were um, led uh, with adolescents in Guatemala with uh, indigenous communities, Cachiqueles, Maya Cachiqueles. Uh, Sixteen interviews with experts working with adolescents and young populations, either as teachers, community mobilizers, um, health promoters, or community leaders. So I did not do the field work, which is really weird for me, because <laughs> I'm my undergrad is in anthropology, and I'm like Sarah. I was like, Ooh, I want to go into the field again and like collect data. Mm -hmm. And they were like, mm, but this thing is like you're you're like a master's student now, mm -hmm. and like you've done all this work for us before, and now you're like you're going to be our our expert. And I was like, oh. <laughs> yeah. um, and so I had to do the analysis of all all the qualitative data. I also had to do some lit research uh, on peer education and sexual uh, reproductive health, but also how cycle beads have been used in other contexts with adults, with young people, um, with adults teaching young people and young people teaching young people, etc. I also did some uh, research on sexual education curriculums that are available in the region, and this is one of the examples, one of my favorite books in Guatemala on sexual reproductive rights. Um, because it portrays ten different uh, sexual reproductive rights in a, with poems, with illustrations, or with little text. So even though you don't know how to read, you might get the uh, the idea. But also the fact that your sexual reproductive uh, rights are all on your lifetime, not only when you're sexually active, or when you have babies, or a family, or, like, or when you're married and connecting it to policy framework, which is part of my interests. So this is one of the products I delivered. I wasn't going to show you the reports of the focus groups or the interviews, because it's too long. Mm -hmm. uh, so I had to do, I had to work closely with the illustrator to tell him ideas of what illustrations I wanted on the, on the booklet. And, 
what elements needed to be there, what uh, key messages had to be included, thinking that this tool can be used with girls and with boys as well. So it's to start a conversation, as I said. And it was funny that you ended up with, uh, you know, how girls stop going to school. It's, it's in Guatemala it happens as well in many of the indigenous communities and even in the non-indigenous communities in certain schools. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a shame. They, they miss at least a week every single month or even more because they've missed a week so, so far. So they disconnect from school and they just stop going. So this is just the first draft. It's, this is uh, ongoing research. So right now they're in the validation period. Um, I did not do the drawings. <laughs> so, I was like, no, we have to include this. And it was a pretty interesting uh, process as I'll talk to you afterwards. So this basically has two sides, and you fold it, and it ends up being a booklet this size that will come or accompany the, the necklace. Um, part of what we're thinking is less text and more um, like younger looking people <laughs> in the illustrations. Uh, but it's a good start. And also the future is having it in at least four of the main indigenous languages in Guatemala. Not only in Spanish. So, skills are not skills until you practice them. And um, the first thing that I learned during this process was the weird dynamic that can happen when you lead a research team. I've always been part of a research team and I've had like someone, you know, like, can you give me a report? Can you like show up for this meeting? And this time I was like, can we meet on Skype at this time? Can you have the transcriptions of the focus groups for this day? And at the same time, balancing the fact that uh, they are co-researchers, we're equals. But at the same time, I'm a leader. So um, then the analysis of the data. I love uh, analyzing data, and I've done it before, but I've collected the data myself. So it was part of learning also, of letting go a little bit of the control freakness. <laughs> and saying like, uh, yes, the focus groups you did, even though you lost the notes, it's okay. We, we can work with it. Um, learning the dynamics of working uh, as a group and, and just analyzing data that was being given to me. Um, at the same time, I was responsible for delivering the products to Population Council and to uh, the Institute for Reproductive Health. So at moments, it was also skillfully communicating when I was in Guatemala and when I was in India as well, so trying to, you know, like, time frames and languages and Skype meetings and internet connections <coughs> that are slow sometimes. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, being able to be diplomatic to say, you told me to do this, and this is my opinion as a, as a, expert, which I never used. As a person that has been working in sexual reproductive health with young populations in Guatemala. Um, because it's managing expectations from the organization in Georgetown with the organization in Guatemala, and managing the expectations, although I didn't like ask them, I read their responses, the young people and the, the teachers and the leaders at the communities, what they're expecting from this project. Um, and the fact of managing languages, but also communication in, in, more, in more detail. So, uh, as I said, I wanted to end with connections as well. And so I was thinking how important the discourse and the practicality as well of the Millennium Development Goals are right now. And in Guatemala, everyone uses it. It's like the private sector, the public sector, they're like, we're going to work for them and it's going to happen. So you can use it as a tool. It's like, okay, you want things to happen? We need to start educating young people about their bodies, about their health, about their sexual reproductive rights. Because once women and men, young and old, know how their body works, how they can have safer sex, when not to have sex, um, who they want to have sex with, they might be able to empower themselves in other ways as well, as citizens, as mothers, once they want to be mothers. Um, so I think sexual
sexual education can be one of the tools to empower people and to really get to reduce maternal mortality, specifically in adolescents, and child mortality as well, and to have universal access for, for kids. Uh, finally, so the partnership part in all this project was one of the things that made me think the most or reflect upon my own like, position as a practitioner, as a researcher. Um, as I said, treating people that are finishing their undergrad uh, in, not in the city, in Guatemala, but, and that speak not Spanish as their first language, but Cachiquel. And knowing that they have, and they taught me a lot during this process. And at the same time, having, you know, being in a partnership where I'm also an urban Guatemalan mestiza woman who can bring something to the table as an international student right now. And going it from the individual maybe level of partnerships, going to a big level of partnerships between organizations that are not working necessarily on the ground in Guatemala or have a small project in Guatemala and linking it to partnerships between NGOs and the government. Because eventually this can um, inform policy and be like, there's a law that says that kids should be receiving sexual education in the public schools. Here's a tool that can start the conversation. It's not enough to talk to start just talking about puberty, but it's, it's a start. You can start talking to 10, 12 year olds about puberty. It's coming, so mm -hmm. you better be ready for it. <laughs> I believe that when you see how research can inform real processes and that you're part of that research, you feel like what you're doing is useful. Like you're not just collecting data for learning how to use a method. Like it's actually going to have results. And the field of global health is an exciting field for applied research. And we all know. And communication, it was one of the it was it was good to see myself that I could manage India, Guatemala, and uh, Denver and Washington at the same time. It was crazy at moments, um, but that's why we're studying international development. Um, and uh, I just need to work. There there were several moments where some of the emails were not really you know. They didn't understand the message I was trying to send. And I was like, no, 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 no. It's not only, you know, like, I don't speak English as my first language. It's just, you're not reading my email. <laughs> 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 but I didn't say that, of course. It was like learning how to connect um, my own expectations of this research process and uh, the expectations that the organization had and, and the young people were doing. And finally, it's, um, I think this tool can be used in many different contexts. This type of research can be applied in different contexts. And the lessons learned from uh, Rwanda, where they did it, and in Guatemala, where we're doing it, could be translated into other contexts and adapted for the different young populations that need and deserve to know about their health and their reproductive health.
setting like sectors of the of the interview. And with the focus groups, it was a little bit um, more complicated because there were guides for the groups with boys and the guys with girls. But what I tried to do was summarize and compare these two first, the two focus groups and the two focus groups, and then contrast like the gender differences. Um, but yeah, I didn't have the software to do it. So if you were to have a class on a Corvell, <laughs> slash uh, plug for Micah. So yes, for, for people who are thinking about uh, doing either polishing up the research they did uh, this past summer, if you're second year, or if you're first year looking to get research off the ground, we will be restarting uh, the community-based research methods class in spring after two years of it being canceled because I'm, my wife is always having babies. You know, I, we don't know how to use that. No. Um, uh, um, or because we were using them. Um, we, yes, that course will be coming back. So if there are skills that we can uh, sort of incorporate to shape the class, and of course if we can bring people like Maho and Micah, who's working on a thesis, and Sophie, who's doing interviews for a thesis, into uh, some of the training portion of that course, that will also be awesome. We have a, 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 the thing I love about these presentations is right, it demonstrates we have depth and breadth, right? We have people doing great work on our projects, and we have people doing amazing work on other projects. So thank you so much to Sarah and the and Mother. Just incredible work. Actually, does anyone have any questions that they want to just throw at the entire uh, group of students? There will be at the party. I do actually have a comment though. Um, after Kate's presentation on her Summer Achievement Award, we did a very similar thing, I think, you were there, Micah, where we kind of suggested that we should have an ME class. And just to kind of update on all the interesting parties, um, we really tried hard to get this kind of up and running for winter, and it doesn't look great. So keep your fingers crossed for that mixed methods um, class in the spring, or hopefully an ME class for, for spring quarter. And for those of you that are graduating in March, um, too bad. <laughs> too bad. Stay longer. On, on the mixed methods, the 
good news is, I mean, I'll just say right now, that the community-based research is on the books, and I am happy to do these methods. So that's why I don't know exactly how many weeks or in what form. We have a lot of ground to cover, but that, that will be there. That? Yeah, so that, that will happen. I'm not going to teach anything, so there's still work that's in there. Yeah, so keep, keep, keep brainstorming people. And